Good evening. I encourage you to get relaxed in your favorite chair, or lie down in your bed. Today's bedtime story I'll read to you from the nonfiction novel by Tom Wolfe, entitled "The Right Stuff." Chapter Six, on the balcony. From the very beginning, this astronaut business was just an unbelievable good deal. It was such a good deal that it seemed like tempting fate for an astronaut to call himself an astronaut, even though that was the official job description. You didn't even refer to the others as astronauts. You'd never say something such as, "I'll take that up with the other astronauts." You'd say, "I'll take that up with the other fellows," or the other pilots. Somehow, calling yourself an astronaut. Was like a combat ace, going around describing his occupation as a combat ace. This thing was such an unbelievable good deal. It was as if astronaut were an honorific, like champion or superstar. As if the word itself were one of the infinite varieties of goodies that Project Mercury was bringing your way. And not just goodies in the crass sense either. It had all the things that made you feel good, including the things that were good for the soul. For long stretches, you'd bury yourself in training, in blissful isolation, good, rugged, bare-boned isolation. In low-rent surroundings. In settings that even resembled hallowed Edwards in the old X one days, and with the same pioneer spirit which money cannot buy, and with every body pitching in and working endless hours, so that rank meant nothing. And people didn't even have the inclination, much less the time, to sit around and make the usual complaints about government work. And then, just about the time when you were entering a good, healthy state of exhaustion from the work, they would take you out of your isolation and lead you up to that balcony that all fighter jocks secretly dreamed of—the one where you walked out before the multitudes like the Pope, and it actually happened. The people of America cheered their brains out for thirty-five minutes or so. And then you went back into your notable isolation for more work, or for a few proficiency runs at nailing down the holy coordinates of the fighter jock's life, which were, of course, flying and drinking and drinking and driving and the rest of it. These things you could plot on the great graph of Project Mercury in the most spectacular way. With the exception of the first, flying. The lack of time flying was troubling, but the other items existed in such extraordinary dimensions that it was hard to concentrate at first. Any man who wasn't above a little regrouping now and then to keep the highly trained mechanism from being wound up too tight, to maintain an even strain, in the sheer parlance. Found himself in absolute fighter jock heaven, but even the rare pilot, who was aloof from such cheap thrills such as the Deacon John Glenn, found plenty of goodies to even out the strain of hard work and mass adoration. Each of them had an eye on Glenn. All right, Glenn's own personal conduct was but a constant reminder of what the game was really all about. To all but Scott Carpenter, and perhaps one other, the way Glenn was going about this thing was irritating. The seven of them were stationed at Langley Air Force Base, in the tidewater section of Virginia on the James River, about one hundred fifty miles due south of Washington. Langley had been the experimental facility of the old National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And was now the headquarters of NASA's Space Task Group for Project Mercury. 
every morning they could count on seeing John Glenn up early, out on the grounds, in the middle of everything, where nobody could miss him, doing his road work. He'd be out there in full view on the circular driveway of the bachelor officer's quarters, togged out in his sweatsuit, his great freckled face flaming red and shining with sweat, going around and around, running a mile, two miles, three miles. There was no end to it, in front of everybody. It was irritating because it was so unnecessary. There had been a vague medical directive to the effect that each of them would engage in at least four hours of unsupervised exercise per week. But that was the last that was heard of. The medical staff assigned to Project Mercury were mainly young military doctors, a bit dazzled by the mission. Some of them, and they were not about to call an astronaut on the carpet and demand an accounting of his four hours. Fighter jocks, as a breed, put physical exercise very low on the list of things that made up the right stuff. They enjoyed the rude animal health of youth. They put their bodies through dreadful abuses, often in the form of drinking bouts followed by lack of sleep and mortal hangovers, and they still performed like champions. Most agreed with Wally Shira, who felt that any form of exercise that wasn't fun, such as water skiing or handball, was bad for your nervous system. But here was Glenn, pounding through everybody's field of vision with his morning road work, as if he were preparing for the championship fight. The good Marine didn't just do his road work and leave it at that, either. Oh no. The rest of them had their families installed at Langley Air Force Base, or at least in the Langley vicinity. Gordon Cooper and Scott Carpenter and their families were packed into apartments on the base, the usual sort of worn-out base housing that junior officers raided. Wally Shira, Gus Grissom, and Deke Slayton lived in a rather sad-looking housing development on the other side of the Newport News Airport. Around the development was a stucco wall of the color known as glum ochre. Alan Shepard and his family lived a little farther away in Virginia Beach, where they happened to be living when he was chosen for Project Mercury. But Glenn... Glenn has his family housed 120 miles away in Arlington, Virginia, outside of Washington, and at Langley, he stays in the bachelor officer's quarters, the BOQ, and does his running out front in the driveway. If this had been some devilishly clever scheme for him to get away from home and hearth and indulge in drinking and driving and so forth, that would have been one thing. But he wasn't the type. He was living in a bare room with nothing but a narrow bed and an upholstered chair and a little desk and a lamp, and a lineup of books on astronomy, physics, and engineering, plus a Bible. On the weekdays, he would faithfully make his way home to his wife Annie, and the children, in an ancient friend's, a real beat-up junker that was about four feet long and perhaps forty horsepower, the sorriest-looking and most underpowered automobile still legally registered to any fighter pilot in America. A jock with any natural instincts at all, with any true devotion to the holy coordinates, either possessed or was eating his heart out for the sort of car that Alan Shepard had, which was a Corvette, or that Wally Shira had, which was a Triumph. A sports car, or some kind of hot car, anyway, something that would enable you to hang your hide out over the edge with a little class when you reached the driving juncture on the coordinates several times a week, as was inevitable for everyone but someone like John Glenn. This guy was putting on an incredible show. He was praying in public. 
he was presenting himself in their very midst as the flying monk, or whatever the Presbyterian version of a monk was. A saint, maybe, or an ascetic, or maybe just the village scone crusher. Being a good Presbyterian, John Glenn knew that praying in public was no violation of the faith. The faith even encouraged it. It set a salubrious example for the public. Nor did John Glenn feel the slightest discomfort because now, in post-World War II America, virtue was out of style. Sometimes he seemed to enjoy shocking people with his clean living. Even when he was no more than nine years old, he had been the kind of boy who would halt a football game to read the riot act to some other nine-year-old who said, God damn it, when a play didn't go right. This was an unusual gesture even where he grew up, which was New Concord, Ohio, but not so extraordinary as it might have been a lot of other places. New Concord was a sort of town once common in America, whose peculiar origins have tended to disappear in a collective amnesia as Tulemans strives to be urbane. Which is to say, it began as a religious community. A hundred years ago, any man in New Concord, with ambitions that reached as high as feed store proprietor, or better, joined the Presbyterian Church, and some of the awesome voltage of live Presbyterianism still existed when Glenn was growing up in the 1920s and 1930s. His father was a fireman for the B&O Railroad, and a good church-going man, and his mother was a hard-working, church-going woman, and Glenn went to Sunday school and church and sat through hundreds of indeterminable Presbyterian prayers, and the church and the faith and the clean living served him well. We'll end there. Thank you, and have a great night.